We sprak met Björk en met PJ Harvey. Onder meer over de hippie jeugd van beide dames en over het schrijven van liedjes. Vanavond in Lola de Musica een dubbel portret van Björk en PJ Harvey. Twee dames die weliswaar verschillen wat betreft muzikale invloeden, maar beide via het independent circuit uitgroeiden tot eigen tijdse pop divas. Björk Gudmunds Dottier, 29 jaar, vroege zangeres van de Sugar Cubes, verruilde haar geboorteland IJsland voor Londen en begon daar twee jaar geleden aan een zeer succesvolle solo carrière. In 1993 verscheen van Björk de cd Debut, waarop ze dance met pop combineerde. Begin volgende maand komt haar nieuwe plaat uit, getiteld Post. I was uh, the first child of... Uh... Een moeder en een vader die had been in love sinds ze 14 jaar oud waren. En ze uh, was geboren toen mijn moeder 19 was, mijn vader 20. En ze waren heel conservatief, maar happy soort of people. En toen, uh, when mijn moeder had been a housewife for one year with me, she uh, freaked out and became a wild hippie. En a feminist. En ze separated with mijn vader. And my father remained very conservative and married a nurse, and but very hardworking, honest, very energetic man, and very uh, full of full of power and joy for life. And my mother, being completely just wanting to be a strong and painting all the walls with butterflies, and and I live in a house with a lot of people uh, who have long hair and listen to Jimi Hendrix. So I go between the two families and I learn, okay, maybe freedom isn't having uh, long hair and maybe discipline isn't suit and not take anything for granted. Polly Jean Harvey ontbond het trio waarmee ze eerder twee cd's maakte en ging solo verder. Nog altijd onder de naam PJ Harvey. De nieuwste cd van de 25-jarige uit Engeland afkomstige PJ heet To Bring You My Love. En daarop klinkt ze toegankelijker, maar ook dramatischer dan ooit. Mijn parents have very, I've always been very encouraging um, to myself and my brother in whatever we wanted to do. But they're both very artistic and very interested in music. Um, my father quarries stone, handstone, and my mum sculpts in it and she also does letter cutting for gravestones and house names and things like that and they've just um they've just always had a huge love of music it's so important to them it was almost like a role reversal uh, my brother and i would be woken up at three in the morning with mum and dad putting on really loud music and couldn't sleep and um but it's mostly they're mostly interested in blues music and rhythm and blues um and Bob Dylan and the Stones. They were never Beatles fans, it was always the Stones. And then I went to music school when I was five, for 10 years, and I played me classical music all the time. My mother always played me hippie music. It's like guitar solos 24 hours in my house, like on 10. And my, uh, my grandparents and my real father, they uh, listened to a lot of jazz and Simon and Garfunkel and all this uh, more stuff conservative music and I enjoy all of them I love all of them and I like immediately to show the three different worlds not to take granted for the four they have so I go with uh, with the Jimi Hendrix record to my uh, grandparent and show them that maybe his solos were not far from jazz and it's very nice and then I, I take uh, the uh, jazz record to the, my music school and show them or maybe uh, You know, uh, Miles Davis was uh, related to Stravinsky. Maybe it's not a big uh, difference between the two. And then I take classical music back to my parents. And I like very much to be the outside there and show 
you know, the... Like, ta -da! Life is not that simple. It's more to than you think, sort of thing. Why not you happy? Cause I love you. I bought my first guitar when I was about 18, I think. I'd been playing saxophone since I was 11, so I already had quite a large interest in music and I could read music. Um, and then um, I think it was just a, a musician friend of ours was selling an acoustic guitar, so I bought it. Well, I thought, well, this might be interesting. I, can, I could then be singing and playing an instrument at the same time. What taught you to play it? Um, I taught myself from chord books and um, and from my favourite bands called songbooks and things like that. And I remember I had a Bob, Bob Dylan songbook and a, a police songbook, I think, was the ones I had. Do you remember the first song you ever written on it? Um, yes, unfortunately, yes. Are you embarrassed about it? Yes, extremely embarrassed. <laughs> what was it about? Oh, oh, I don't know. It was some journey, some girl on the journey, but it was done in a very... Um, very young way. I mean, it is just very naive, very sweet. Um, I wrote a lot of songs that will never see the light of day. I usually write a song when I'm celebrating one thing or another. Um, I tend to deal um, with um, my sad moments on my own and prefer to share the happy ones. And I don't think it's good or bad, it's just that people have different ways of dealing with different things. But um, I don't know, I, I, I like to, things, songs just happen um, they just come all of a sudden and, and you just have to deal with them, they just pop up and you just uh, don't relax, you go mad until you finish them the way they're supposed to be. Sometimes it, a song will just come through you, it really feels like that and you've just got to be open enough to allow it to do that and sometimes it need, it'll need no shaping and it's just there within five minutes and you kind of Look back and think, where on earth did that come from? Because that was not, I hadn't been thinking of that at all. But the, I mean, it doesn't happen all the time. And a lot of the time, songs take months and months of really hard work and shaping, careful shaping, knocking bits out, putting the bits back, trying different bits in different places. Um, really, really hard work. But at the end of the day, writing a song is, is like organising an accident. That's, that's very much what my job is about. To be kind of really organized and disciplined and kind of like get, yeah, nine pianos. Yes, this piano has to be here and this piano has to be here. And I want two people to play this piano and five people to play this piano. And try to set it up like you're setting a trap in a forest for an animal. But of course, you don't know what, where the animal is going to run and, and what's going to happen. So you just got to sit back and make the animal go where it wants to go. And if it come your way, just uh, appreciate it and, and enjoy it. I live by the ocean. I 
very introvert, especially in the winter, just on their own, very strong, self-sufficient, don't need anything. They don't need the sun to make them happy because they can do it themselves. And sometimes a bit too proud that way. Like if an Icelandic person would, would lose his leg, he would say, ah, I didn't need it anyone. Anyway, it was always in the way for the other leg, sort of thing. And that's very much of an Icelandic philosophy, which sometimes can be like, bit Viking and boring, it's like, yeah, yeah, I know you're very strong, yeah, I, I've got the picture, you know? But at the same time, when an Icelandic person uh, communicates, it's it's 100% and, and it's very full on, everything's very full on. They're workaholics, they work 18 hours a day, all week, and they don't drink, because if you drink one glass of red wine in the middle of the week, it's a waste of t t wine, time, and money, so, so you just, uh, Work all week, very strong, like sleep, work, sleep, work, sleep, work, sleep, work. And then you go on the weekend and get a whole liter of vodka and drink properly. And it's not worth it unless you have sort of jumped between the roofs of the houses and done some, you know, <coughs> with your friends and laugh very loud, but not complain. Don't complain. Self-pity is a crime. I was, I've just been very used to spending time on my own coming from this quite small village where there wasn't any other girls to play with. And there's just uh, boys, my brother's friends, who are all old, older than me. Um, so I just got used to spending a lot of time on my own and a lot of good things came of that as well because you, you then use your imagination a lot and you make, you make situations or you make people to play with if you haven't got them and you have a very active and abundant imagination. I tried living in London for a while. I moved there specifically to go to art college and then because the music took off at that point, um, I chose not to go to college so I found myself living in London where I didn't really have to be. But I thought I'd try it anyway. And I just didn't enjoy it. I think after my whole life in the, in the countryside, it just felt very alien to me and it wasn't something that I became used to. I tried it for a while thinking I'll get better at this, but it just made me unhappy, really. What's the thing that uh, draws you to the countryside, then? Seeing the magnificence of the, just the countryside, the beauty of it, how vast it is, how small we are, that kind of thing. When I was a kid, <coughs> I used to uh, walk a lot outside between my grandma's house, <coughs> my father's house, my mother's house, my school, my music school. And because Iceland, most of it, it's kind of like nobody lives there. It means that when I walked, I could sing and sing and sing and, and, and nobody could hear me. And that's how I learned to sing. And that's what I did for, I don't know, 10 years or 15 years or whatever of my life. And that was like my little treasure, my little secret. And then when I met an um, engineer much later, first of all, they tried to ask me to be in one place while I sing, which is absolutely ridiculous to me. Um, it took them ages to, to teach me that one, and I, I sort of managed to learn. But then uh, they, uh, I would sing very quiet and whisper and be all delicate, and the next second I would scream, and everything would... Um, explode and, and uh, they would have to repair everything and I would sit there kind of all embarrassed and so uh, so but, but then again I've been singing now for about 17 years in microphones and I thought I might allow myself a uh, one luxury and, and uh, that would be sing outside again so we would we would um, record the songs and mix them do like an instrumental mix of them and we would and after in the evening we would uh, they would buy some beers and we would get like an ADAT machine and the duck machine and headphones with very, very, very long lead. 
A microphone with a very, very long lead. And they would sit there behind the bush with it, sitting and drinking their beers around midnight in a starry sky. And I would go and run on the beach and go away from them so nobody can see me like black and the stars above and put my feet in the ocean and out and sing the quiet bit next to the sand to change the sound of the microphone like this and, and stand up and run and sing the happy bits and go into the bush and hide behind. And it was it was a um, complete goose pimple experience for me. It was very, very precious and I hope I can sing like that more in the future. Your rescue A lot of the excitement is the possibilities of what could be um, and usually when you finally get there it's a bit of an anti-climax <laughs> but um, yes yeah, so it's always that the imagining of what it could be is the most exciting part what it could be like I've, I think about that in terms of songwriting often as well that the very initial idea if that's like a couple of words on a page or a, a very small picture or something that's the best that that can ever be, that the song will ever be. That's the best, and then from there on, it'll be a bit of an anticlimax. I suppose it's the same with relationships as well, or certainly ones I've experienced so far. That it's always the kind of the starting point, and it's the most exciting, and it has the most possibilities, the widest scope, and then it kind of gets back into being reality again. So I probably enjoy that un the unreal plane side of it. Down by the This water fetish it seems to be getting larger and larger. Um, I dream about water all the time. Um, and I have this huge need to be in it, around it, near it, smell it, touch it, everything. It's a reassurance for me, the water. Mm. When did you first uh, realise that you could be confident about, or are you confident about your songwriting? No, I'm not confident, and I never will be. In fact, when I'm when I'm writing, it's it's a very very uncomfortable time because I go through so much self doubt at every single step of the way. You can go within a space of five minutes. You can ha have a new idea, a new song that you're working on that you think this is great, this is really good. Yeah, I I can do this. And five minutes later, you think, how on earth? I have thought that this is just a load of rubbish and I'm just going to leave it and what am I doing, I should be doing something else. So it's always the same and it's always really hard. I'm never full of confidence. <clears throat> I think 99% uh, of jazz is shit, 90% of dance music is shit, 90% of contemporary like minimalist music for example is shit, you know, 90% op of opera is shit, but it's that 1% that stick out. And 99% of my music is shit, I think. It's, I just try and try and try and try and try, and then at one time it works. In the night, I look for love. Get my strength from the man above. Got a piston. Out of steel, God is here behind my wheel. Do you think that the media have created an image of you that is not yours? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think very much so. People have, I mean, not all the time, but a lot of the time, there's this sort of image of me as, as a quite an unpleasant person, really. I think, or oh, people. Very often people seem to come to interviews being quite nervous about it, or which I don't know why that is. I suppose it's because people know that I don't favour doing interviews a lot, but that's not because I hate the process. It's just uh, like everybody else, I'd rather not be doing them and I find them a bit uncomfortable. Um, but it's, again, it's, it's a necessary process and it's something you have to come to terms with. But um, 
and I suppose through the music as well and through images that I choose to use maybe people think I'm some sort of man-eater or something which is so, so far from the truth that I thought I should be in the magazine and in the television and on the radio and it should be me to just be like the same version of me that I know which is a big misunderstanding and then I realized really quickly that um, these th are two different things you know the person in the, in the media and me and that's not because I'm putting on a show or, or pretending or anything it's just the same way as this room looks completely different from the inside or from the outside it doesn't mean that that um, the person that's outside and can't see the sofa is seeing like it's, li it's a lie but it's still you know so so it's just a little game game I try I try to play not with um, don't mean it in a cheap way or anything like that but you just gotta be aware of it it's it's not to sort of die for you know particularly on tour it's such a it's almost the complete opposite to my life when I'm at home because when I'm at home I just can be very stable. I can be in one. I can go for days without seeing people. It's very quiet, very peaceful. And then, then when you're on tour, you're never anywhere for very long. Constantly on the move, constantly dispersed with a lot of people around you. So it's. Um, I think I need both sides of that in my life. And uh, I don't I just need them both as much as each other one wouldn't work properly or I wouldn't appreciate one side without the other. One and a half year ago I was asked to perform at Brit Awards and they asked me to do a, a duet with Meatloaf and I was like, um, yeah, um, thank you. Uh, Sometimes uh, you have two things you like, like you have chocolate and you have onion, but maybe you should not cook the same dish out of it, you know? And they say, oh, 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 oh. And then they suggest the David Bowie, and I'm like, oh, again, I'm very honored. He's genius, everything, but I'm not sure. Uh, we have a lot to give each other today, you know? It's maybe not very right timing or something. And I'm like, okay, okay, okay. And I'm like, can I make a suggestion? And like, can I ask Polly? And they're like, yeah, yeah. And I asked Polly, and she said yes too, and I was so happy. Pop music to me is very, very important. And, and I think it's one of the most powerful forces in daily life. I talked to my friend in America the other day, and he asked me, uh, say, oh, fuck this uh, pop music all the time. It's bollocks, you know? And he's a bit of a snob, and he wants me to be writing stiff rack music or something like this, you know? And I'm like, no, it's not. It's so important. It's a lot more powerful, you know? And there are certain problems, say, like personal problems. Say the average... American person would get into trouble. Who would they, they call for help? Aretha Franklin or Bill Clinton? And I think 90% of them, if they have a heartbreak, they would put Aretha Franklin song on. Or they would, um, if they want to celebrate life, which is just as important as being sad, they would put, you know, R-E-S-B-C-T, like Aretha Franklin on. And she would be there. Aretha Franklin is always there for them when they need her. And, and Bill Clinton, of course, he takes care of other areas, which is like maybe politics, well, takes care, takes care not of, you know, we can argue forever about that. Let's skip that one. But there are people that take care about politics, big politics. That's important. But music, pop music takes care of the personal politics. And if they wouldn't do it, Nobody would. Even in a situation where not even your best friend can talk to you for 10 hours and you can't help you, the right song will. And, and that's how important pop music is. <laughs> 